Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, the standard method to using technology in the classroom. Let's innovate. My name is Pedro Escalante, and I'm the digital treasurer. Today I'll be serving as your moderator, along with Mary Allegra, who is Ventizel's president. You will be hearing a presentation from Janta Elizondo on this very timely subject. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the chat on YouTube. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them at the end of your presentation. Moreover, a certificate of attendance will be mailed in PDA format upon successful completion of this webinar. In order to earn this certification, you'll be, uh, you will be mailed by Ventizel, and you'll have to reply to this email answering the following questions. Number one, what are the two major sections in which the model is divided? Number two, what's the difference between substitution and uh, redefinition? Number three, what do the A and M stand for in the summer model? Uh, okay, then we have here, those are the questions that you have to answer in order to get your certificate. Now, on behalf of Central American and the Caribbean based in TESOL affiliates and then TESOL, thank you for joining us today. The countries that are part of these affiliates are Belize, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, Peru, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and Venezuela. There are some upcoming events. So we have here the 24th uh, Beta Bolivia Convention, integrating international multicultural experiences in ELT. So we have the date from January the 6th to the 10th and next year. So we have here the venue, Santa Cruz de la Sierra, Bolivia. Then you have the Facebook and the contact information. So you can have here the webpage, www.betabolivia.org. Okay. So then you have the Facebook, Beta Bolivia and TESOL and IAE TAFO. And there's another event here in Colombia, TESOL Colombia 2019. The name going beyond theory, rejuvenated literacies. So we have either date from May 16th to May 18th next year. The venue, Universidad de la Sabana in Chia. Chia is close to Bogota. And they are still calling for papers. The deadline is on December 15th this year, right? And then there are some topics here. So the trends assessment, innovation, methodology, and material, uh, material design, teacher development, digital learning experiences, teaching and learning communities, and language learning and literacies. ACPI TESOL Costa Rica Convention 2019, competence and teaching practices for effective performance. The date from July the 3rd, to July the 5th, the next year. And the venue is in San Jose. So you have here the contact information, the email address, amadridimos at hotmail.com. I would like to introduce our presenter, Jonathan Elizondo. Jonathan Elizondo is an experienced Costa Rican EFL professional who devotes his time and energy seeking ways to enhance his students' learning processes. He is especially interested in exploring the impact of technology in the English classroom and specifically in using ICTs to improve the students' language skills. Currently, this is the topic of his dissertation to obtain a PhD in education from Universidad Internacional Iberoamericana, 
in Mexico. Mr. Elizondo also holds a master degree in teaching English as a foreign language and a bachelor in primary education with emphasis in English teaching. Both degrees from University of Costa Rica. Jordan has experience teaching English to different age groups. At present, he works as a teacher for the Ministries of Public Education, professor at Universidad Estatal a Distancia, and as a speaking examiner for Cambridge English. A thought he is strongly identifies with is Albert Einstein's, I never teach my pupils, I only provide the conditions in which they can learn. This presentation, we have here the abstract. How many of us have struggled trying to incorporate technology into our classes? How much time have we invested trying to use the proper technology either to plan our activities or to get, to get the students to use it? As teachers, we are afraid of using ICTs because we think we don't have the resources or we don't know how to use them correctly. Three, three is, there is no way back. Technology is second nature to our Gen X and Gen, Gen Y. Uh, sorry, Gen X and Gen Y students. The world today is shaped around technology and educational institutions have incorporated technology in the curriculum. Dr. Puentedura provides us with the summer method to implement technology in the classroom because by using technology we're empowering our students to take responsibility for their own learning and promoting independent learners who can successfully navigate in the 21st century. In this webinar we will explore the method and tools that help us achieve our objectives as we all as well have to analyze some of the benefits and that technology brings to enhance our students' learning process. Now, moving along to our webinar, please welcome Jonathan Elizondo, who will be speaking to us on the summer method. Thank you, Pedro, for that um, introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this uh, webinar. So in the next uh, 35 minutes, we will be talking about the summer model of uh, using technology in the classroom. Um, I want to thank all the people from Ecuador, Saudi Arabia, Costa Rica, Indonesia, Spain, and from any other latitude that you might be um, watching today. So, uh, and I, I want to thank the TESOL organization, especially ACPI, the Costa Rican, um, the Costa Rican Association for Teachers of English, for this opportunity and for having invited me uh, to share with you today. So I'm going to start sharing my presentation here, and then we can start. So uh, the summer model to using technology in the classroom. I entitled this presentation or the last part of this presentation as let's innovate, because as teachers, we are required to do things differently. For many, many years, we have heard in, uh, in at university classrooms and in different talks that the world is changing and the discipline that changes the least is education. And I think that's because we sometimes are afraid of innovating or we are afraid of doing things a little differently. Um, however, it's necessary to do so. Uh, so before we start or we talk about the summer mo uh, model, let's think about or let's talk about the three main reasons for using technology in the classroom. So the first one is that today people communicate using technology and there is no um, way back. I mean, we're using WhatsApp, we're using Facebook, we're using Hangouts, we're using YouTube, and we communicate with people all over the, or all over the world. Um, technology is used for learning. We have a lot of platforms, we have a lot of tools in which we can use technology with our students and for learning, uh, I don't know, you want to you wanna do whatever on your own and you go to YouTube and you find the do-it-yourself tutorials, right? And technology is largely used in English. Um, even today, 2018, most of the information that we find online 
is in English. So we need to prepare our students for that. Here you have some uh, logos of Enmodo, Voice of America, Facebook, Skype, uh, WhatsApp, and I can mention so many others that can help us or that we use nowadays um, to communicate and to interact with people. Now, technology also empowers, and this is why we need to use or to incorporate technology in our classrooms. And when I talk about our classrooms, and I want to I want to um, be clear on this, I am not talking about primary or high school or university. I'm talking about classrooms in general, and the method and the tools we're going to see today can be applied to any population, children, young learners, adults, young adults, anybody can use these tools. So technology empowers teachers. How? It provides us with sources, data, and methods, and with new ways to teach. So how sources? In the past, I remember that teachers usually had only the books and the photocopies or the CDs that they had, and that was all they, they were able to access. Nowadays, you go online and you have so much information and so many sources of information that you can use with your students. Um, data and methods and new ways to teach are kind of related, and I'm going to tell you my experience. Last year, we started with a new curriculum in the English classroom in uh, Costa Rica. And one of the things is that we are teaching now phonemic awareness. So I started with some activities, but then I ran out of ideas. I just went online, Pinterest, uh, YouTube, and many other uh, websites, and I found so many, um, so many ways in which I could teach the same material, and that helped me bring um, that helped me bring var variety to my classroom. But technology, most importantly, it empowers students. It gives them choice. So you can tell your students you have to write this paragraph and you have all these different websites or these different tools where you can type your paragraph, for example, something as simple as that. It gives them up-to-date information. In the past, again, when I was at, in college, I remember my professors telling me, uh, go and buy the newspaper, the English newspaper that we had in Costa Rica that was called the Tico Times and I was able to buy it every Friday. What happened was that I was getting the news from last week and not from uh, like current news. Nowadays, your students go into, uh, your, they go online and they get information of things that are happening at the moment everywhere in the world. It gives them opportunities to hear, exposure to the language, and they get interested, and they get motivated, and most importantly, they get independent. And I think this is what we want. We have heard many times the expression learning to learn, and that's what we want our students. We want them to not depend on a teacher, not, not depend on, like, on being in a classroom to be able to learn. We want them to go out of the classroom and be able to uh, learn on their own, and that's what we are moving towards by using technology. So once we have the technology, and once we, we know we want to use technology, many questions arise. So what are these questions? The first one, how can I integrate technology in my class? I have these tools. I have heard people talking about them. I saw WhatsApp, and I, I have used it with my friends, with my family, but how can I integrate that into my class? That's a question teachers might have. Another question is the technology enhancing learning. I mean, the, this technology that I decided to use, is it really helping my students to learn or is it distracting them from the learning? Um, am I innovating or is it just a regular class conducted through technology? That is um, a question that I think we need to ask all the times. And more than having the question initially, after we use every tool in the class, we need to ask this question to ourselves as a way to evaluate our classes. Because we don't want regular classes through technology. We want to innovate, we want to bring new ideas to the class so our students benefit from that. And last but not least, how can I get the most from the use of technology in my class? So. Once I, I clarified all these questions, 
how can I bring technology that actually benefit my students in the class? So um, what is the SAMR model? So the SAMR model was designed by Dr. Ruben Puentedura, and it's to guide teachers towards effectively using technology into their programs. This model is divided into two big um, stages. One stage is called enhancement, and the other stage is called transformation. So enhancement is at the bottom of the model, and transformation is at the top of the model. And they go together with the Bloom taxonomy. So we think every letter, SAMR, S-A-M-R, it means something. So SAMR is actually an acronym for something. So if we think of the S that is at the bottom, it goes with knowledge in Bloom's taxonomy. And R, which is on top of the model, uh, goes or is directly related to synthesis and evaluation in Bloom's taxonomy. So what we want is to change and to innovate, to transform our classroom whenever we use technology. So today we're going to see each of those letters from the acronym and also some tools that can be used in every level or in every stage uh, or every step of the model. So um, very important is that one tool, depending on the task a teacher designs, can work for many different purposes and at many different steps in the model. So let's begin by looking at the first um, step, which is substitution. This is at the bottom. This is part of the enhancement. And what it does is that technology ask as, uh, acts sorry, as a direct substitute with no functional change. So basically, if we think of a whiteboard in which the teacher writes notes and students have to copy, I can bring technology that does the same. Uh, what is that technology? For example, PowerPoint and Microsoft Word. So I can create this presentation using PowerPoint and lecture my students, which is no change at all. It's just substituting the regular whiteboard with this new tool that is technological. Or if we think of our students typing into a Word document, it's the same as just writing into their notebooks. So there's no substitution at all. Some other tools that we have, for example, the British Council, it's the, the website from the British Council, or the website from Voice of America to Learning English. These two websites provides us with, with uh, listening, reading, with writing exercises, and basically you can give your students a grammar lesson with a video from the Voice of America, or you can ask your students to listen to a text in the British Council and then answer some comprehension questions. That is exactly what we do with a CD player or with a cassette uh, player in the past, and there's no change at all. Or we think about Will Decide. Will Decide is a website in which you add different topics or you can add the names of your students into a wheel, and then you, uh, you spin the wheel and the wheel decides for you. So this is exactly the same as putting the students' names on a little bag and take it, taking them out. What happens is that you're just using technology instead. So that is substitution, no meaningful change. Now, the second step is augmentation, and this will finish the enhancement section. So uh, with augmentation, technology acts as a direct substitute with functional improvement. So you see that now we're moving a little more towards doing something different in the classroom. What are some of the tools that I consider can help us? So the first tool is Google Docs. And by Google Docs, I can also mention Word as well. So I mentioned before that Word can be substituting. But let's think of, of, of um, a Word document in which your students type a paragraph and you ask them to pay attention to the underlined words in red or the underlined words in blue, which means a spelling mistake or a structure mistake, a grammar mistake probably. So you actually, there is a little of that um, functional improvement because your students don't have to go back to a dictionary to check. The, the, the tool is telling them what they need to check. 
Google Docs, for example, your students can upload the document and they can access it anywhere, ev uh, anytime. So basically, it is giving some uh, or augmenting the function. We can think of Lingro and Youglish. Lingro is a website in which you introduce the URL and of, of any website, and it transforms that other website into a dictionary. So your students begin reading a news from CNN, for example, and they find a word they don't know. They click on the word, and they have the definition right there. They don't have to go to the dictionary. Or Youglish is partnered or is part of YouTube. What it does is it finds um, it finds the um, like you need a word, you need the pronunciation of a word. You type it, and it finds all the videos that are in YouTube that contain that word and plays the video exactly where the word is, so your students can listen to the word or phrase in natural speech or in normal speech. We can think of Socrative. Socrative is a website to uh, create quizzes. So it might be substitution. If I just think of, take the quiz, here, is, here are the answers, that's substitution. However, uh, augmentation comes when the teacher can share with the students the graphs of the class, like how many students were right, how many students were wrong, and we can analyze the different graphs, and we can see or we can make decisions together as a group as of what structures, what pronunciation, what vocabulary we need to review. Or if we think of Canva, Canva is another website that we can use to um, create infographs or infographics and our students can have fun while they create an infographic on the subject they have studied or a summary of the, uh, of the book they read or the story they read. So that is the end with the enhancement part. Then it comes the transformation. I think this is the kind of most difficult part, but also it's the one we want to get to. So the M means modification. And basically here, technology allows for significant task redesign. So we change the tasks that we usually do in the classroom and we redesign them. Uh, what are some of these? Mentimeter or Spiral. These two websites help me share with my students my PowerPoint presentations in real time. And besides that, my students in real time can interact with the presentation. They can answer polls, and I can see the different graphs that are generated according to or, or based on the students' answers. Um, I can ask, I can pose a question, and everybody participates at the same time. I mean, in a normal classroom, if I ask a question, I need to go student by student. But with these two tools, they type their answer, and I see them on the board, on the presentation, on the screen that I'm, I'm showing the students. It can be anonymous, so people feel more confident. You see that it's redesigning the task. It's redesigning what I'm doing in the classroom. It's modifying. And then we have, for example, Quizlet. Quizlet, let's imagine these uh, activities we used to do with little cards of paper. On one side of the card, you have a concept. On the other side of the card, you have a definition. Or in English, for example, in one side of the card, you have the simple or the base form of the verb. On the back side of the card, you have the uh, simple past of the irregular verb. So what Quizlet does is exactly that. But on top of that, it creates different games. You can use it live with your students. Students can interact with one another. They can, uh, they can even compete among themselves. So you see that the task of using that little card on my own is now socializing a lot. And then we have Storybird. Storybird is a website in which uh, there is a lot of art already created, pictures already created for you. You choose a specific art, and you get all these pictures related to that art. Then you can create your own stories. Uh, your students can put the, the pictures in the order they want. They can design the layout of their book. Then they can share the link with other classmates. And the teacher can also create, create a classroom inside Storybird and then look at or share with everybody what other students are doing. So this is interactive. This is 
uh, something that we don't usually get to do because if we ask our students to bring, for example, magazines to create a story in the classroom, they bring the magazines, but then when they start cutting, they find out that the pictures are so different that it doesn't make sense. I mean, the, the story doesn't look like a real uh, story that has a thread, right? Uh, and again, Google Docs. Uh, you see that we have we have seen Google, and, and this is the I think this is the most basic tool that we can use. And you see substitution, augmentation. Now, how can we do it with modification? Let's think of my students typing a document, and then the teacher can give them immediate feedback. And the student in real time, the student can see the feedback from the teacher. Or the teacher can do it on the weekend, and the student can check the feedback before coming to class again, and he can make changes, and the teacher can see that again, and so on and so forth. The students don't get bored or of writing five drafts of their paper because they're just modifying a little, like some things. So the task is quite different for them. Um, and finally, we have redefinition. So in the redefinition, it's basically that technology allows for the creation of new tasks previously unconceivable or unimaginable. So what is that? Let's look at some examples. MOOCnote. MOOCnote is a website that teachers can create a free um, account. And then you find a YouTube video. You place the YouTube video, and you can add notes in the video. So the students start watching the video, then when the note appears, the video stops and the students can look at the note, they can look, look at the question, uh, the teachers can do a lot of different things with MOOCnote. In the past, you needed a lot of software to be able to add uh, comments to a video. Students can also be the ones in charge of adding the, the notes to the video. They can find a video that they want the teacher to see and they want to show comprehension. So they watch the video and they stop it at some parts so the teacher can actually uh, see that. Then we have VoiceThread. VoiceThread is a website in which you upload your PowerPoint presentations or you can create them from scratch. Then you can add voice uh, comments, or you can add comments that you type. But not only that, you give the link to other users, and those users can add more notes on top of your notes, more comments on top of your comments, and you can even, even add video. So in the past, we were not able to do so. Um, for example, I have the opportunity in one of the academies I work we go to the lab one hour a week. So instead of asking my students to do a presentation in front of everybody, I ask them to use that, that hour to create a presentation, to add voice to it uh, with video, and then I can check it. I can give them feedback, like individualized feedback, and when I see that there is a mistake, I can correct the mistake, and so the student remembers what he or she said. It saves time because instead of using two or three hours of oral presentations in class, I use one hour and everybody is presenting at the same time. Again, in some levels where students feel less comfortable, they feel more secure because it's only the teacher, the one that will evaluate my presentation. Um, then we have quizzes or also um, Kahoot. Quizzes is very similar to Kahoot. You create a quiz, it's interactive, students are competing among themselves. In the past, that was inimaginable. I mean, how can you create a quiz in which your students compete, and at the same time as a teacher, you get the results and you can evaluate them somehow, you can provide them with feedback. With this tool, you actually do that. And again, Google Docs. Uh, let's imagine my students have to create this collaborative text so I form groups, and they can work at any time, anywhere they are. And they can start adding comments. They can start modifying the text. They can see teachers' comments at the same time. In the past, that was very difficult to do. Uh, imagine one paper going around four different people, and then they had to rewrite it, and then again go, go again, and they needed to see each other face to face to be able to give that feedback and to 
be able to produce something together. Now it is not necessary. That was unconceivable before, that was unimaginable, and now it is possible. And finally, we have Edmodo and Tricider. Edmodo is a website that we can use for um, to generate virtual classrooms. It's similar to Moodle, if you have used Moodle before. Edmodo is for free. You don't have to, you don't have to put it into any website. You just create an account. It looks just like Facebook, but it's for educational purposes. And there, you can assign homework, you can create forums, you can share links, you can have assignments with your students. All of that was impossible in the past. Tricider, on the other hand, helps you create very quick brainstorming and voting. So before class, for example, you can send a link to your students in Tricider and ask them about, I don't know, the music genre they like the most. You get all the information and then you bring a song that your students are going to like. So that is pretty much the uh, summer model. Now let's look at this chart that I found that I think it's very interesting and looks, it, it looks, or, or you can see the same task in the different steps. So let's look just at the note taking. I mean, later on you can come back to this presentation and see all the others, but let's look probably one or two. Note taking. Substitution, I ask my students to take notes using iOS notes if they have an iPhone. Augmentation, they choose their own notes app to, uh, to type because maybe they feel more comfortable in one than another one. Modification, all students use Notability. Notability is a website in which they can, or an app in which people can collaborate taking notes together. And redefinition, the teacher has access to all the students' notes. So I can comment on their notes, I can correct some of their notes. If I see that there was misunderstanding, I can correct, and everybody gets informed at the same time. If we do it in the, in the regular notebook, for example, the teacher will need to collect the 30 or 40 notebooks and go one by one uh, adding notes to their notes. But here with the redefinition, we do it uh, just at one time. Um, if we think of reading, for example, substitution, they open a PDF from an email. Augmentation, they use dictionary and search document. Modification, they annotate in documents using, for example, Notability, iBooks, e-readers, etc. Or in redefinition, we add an interactive iBook. Or there are some other websites in which you can do interactive books. So your students are doing something totally different in reading. They can choose their own path, for example, to reading. And at some point, they have to make a decision. And depending on the decision they make, the story they gets a kind of a twist. So um, before moving to the closing of this uh, webinar, we need to make sure whenever we incorporate technology in the class, we are aware of the proficiency cycle. And I want to say this because I have noticed as teachers, sometimes we forget and we want our students to be fluent and to be accurate, but we don't give them time to plan. So by including the planning, uh, into our, or including technology, sorry, into our classes. We let our students plan and they try to be accurate. Then there is time for error correction and finally they can be fluent. So you see that it's a cycle that we can actually um, create, right? Then um, let's look at, uh, at a summary of the summer method. And well, uh, let's think of coffee. If you like coffee as much as I do, I found this metaphor that I, I think it's amazing. So imagine you go to the coffee shop um, and, and, and they are not paying anything for commercials here, right? But uh, let's think that you go to this coffee shop and you ask for a regular coffee. That is substitution. I mean, there's no change. I can prepare that coffee at home and sometimes maybe it can be even better than the coffee I bought. But I can do the augmentation and I can ask for a cappuccino, which is a little functional improvement. The flavor is different and, and now I'm liking it a little bit more. What happens if I still um, change it a little bit more? So 
there is some modification and the task, the coffee, the original coffee is now quite different, right? Uh, but what happens if I start trying different things out and I add pumpkin spice and now the coffee tastes totally different and that's exactly what we can do in the class. We can be these teachers that bring a regular coffee to our students or these teachers that bring a coffee with different tastes that our students didn't know existed before. And I was talking to some colleagues. They, they were asking me, I mean, why do we need to use technology in the class? And I told them our students now are used to technology. The problem is that they don't know how to use technology for learning. And that's where we teachers need to work. We need to teach them and we need to show them that there is more than just watching YouTube videos for entertainment, that they can learn at the same time they are being entertained online, right? Some final thoughts, and these are not my ideas, these are ideas from uh, Professor Capel and Kessler. Uh, so begin by using technologies you are familiar with. If, we, if I like a lot the idea of using MOOCnote, but I am not sure what it is, make sure you use it, you understand it, and once you are familiar with that, bring it to the classroom. Cultivate collaborations with other teachers, and this goes hand by hand with asking colleagues to play the role of the students. Make sure you tell your teachers or your colleagues, can you please check this for me? Can you see if this works? Uh, do you like it? Or do you think my students are going to like it? And, and collaborate with other teachers. What we're doing here right now, it's collaborating with one another, sharing our ideas, sharing our thoughts. And I would be delighted if later I find some ideas on my email or, or you can share some other uh, websites that we can use. Make wise decisions as of when technology is integrated into learning. If you use technology every day, it loses the magic. Or if you use the same technology. So if you use Google Docs every single class, students get bored. If you use Kahoot every single class, they will tell you, teacher, Kahoot again? I mean, we have used it hundreds of times, and that's not funny anymore. Recognize the challenge. I understand every teacher has a different situation. Sometimes we have a, sometimes we have technology, sometimes we don't. In the school I work, I am so grateful that I have flat screen TVs in almost every classroom. I know many teachers don't have that. I don't know if you noticed in one of the previous slides, there was a teacher showing uh, a tablet to the students. Sometimes that's what I do when I don't have access to technology. I bring my own computer, I bring my tablet, and I make students, I got, uh, they gather around me, or I, I go into a website and I ask them, okay, everyone come uh, one at a time and look for the word, for example, look up the word. Um, and so they don't have to use a paper dictionary. And develop your own technology skills. It is not acceptable for a teacher in the 25th century to say, I don't know technology to say, I'm sorry, I was born in 1980, in 1970, in, 19, in 1960, and I don't know technology. It's not acceptable. The, the, the world is changing and we need to change with the world. We need to adapt and we need to make sure we develop our technology skills. There are a lot of websites that offer free courses, online courses, in which you can learn to use technology for your classes. Um, so having said that, I would really like to see uh, your ideas and thoughts. You can contact me through my email. I have my uh, Facebook uh, page, or I also have this website that I created. This one is mostly for teachers in primary school, and I would really like to hear from you. And now it's time for your questions. I don't know if you have uh, questions, if you have comments uh, that, I can, that I can help you with. So thank you very much for your attention, and, and let's see what you have to say now. Okay, so good. Great, Professor Elizondo. I mean, this, is, this has been a very interesting and fabulous presentation uh, because of all the uh, meaningful uh, at the same time, because uh, you have um, related 
the content with, with the examples. And we have seen how this met method works. Um, here I have some comments of some of the people who were um, talking. So we have Lilia at the beginning said that certainly there is a lot of technology included in my classes. One cannot get along with these days. Uh, Savvy uh, said at the beginning also, also we can teach listening and visual learning. Ile Calderon said, I love the idea of integrating technology in the classroom. Mario Alpizar also said, actually, there is a close relation between constructivism and use of ICTs because these technologies promote autonomous learning. Of course, it depends on the proper curricular integration. Ile um, responded and said, I use Canva for cooperative learning and students enjoy and learn at the same time. Ventiso answered and said, technology allows to develop both collaborative and autonomous learning. A proper curricular integration is crucial, just as Professor Elizondo said. Mario Alpizar uh, said, pretty good. There are some tools that Jonathan has presented. I haven't tried yet. Sabi Fatim said, Kahoot is also good for tests. Um, Mario Alpizar uh, responded and said, actually, there is a topic I want to research in the future about downloadable apps for EFL. Susana Arenas said, I've used Edmodo. It is very easy to assign homeworks and take home tests. And then Mario Alpizar said, your topic seems to be interesting. Okay, let's see if there is any other comment here. Um, okay, uh, we have Lilia Petrisiuk saying, a really useful, concise, but dense in ideas. Um, uh, Ile Calderon said, congrats, this presentation was amazing with lots of ideas for us to use in the classroom. Lisette Monica said, uh, congrats. Savi Fatim th said, thank you so much for a nice presentation. Jimmy Johns said, thanks for the great amount of tools you presented and the ideas. Daniel said here. Uh, Mario Pizar said, excellent presentation, Jonathan. Clear and concise presentation of ideas. Uh, we would like to see if uh, the attendees have any questions for Professor Elizondo. You have any question? Okay, Lilia said, I was just wondering if my students choose different channels and tools to complete a task, won't I, as a teacher, be overwhelmed trying to reach them all? Well, um, that's that's a pretty good question. I think when, uh, when we say choice, we need to... Um, somehow give uh, like kind of a, a close-ended choices. We don't want our students to choose any tool. We need to give them tools that we know how to deal with, how to manage. And so we can offer them three or four different tools that they can use. And uh, I think that way we won't feel overwhelmed and we will also have variety when checking the, the work because one tool is different from another one. So that will also help me not get bored and not be uh, like that overwhelmed of checking the same thing so many times because every tool adds some variety to that. Okay, great. Um, okay, Paramita said, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, Laxmi Reddy said, thank you so much for your great ideas and views. Uh, Jorge Leal says, good ideas to practice significant significant assessment. Lilia said, thank you. Uh, I have another question here. Uh, Jesus Sosa said, how would you encourage teachers who are reluctant to integrate technology in their classroom? I would tell those teachers, and I think uh, that, that happens in many Latin American countries, uh, there was a study about Argentina, Costa Rica, Chile, and Mexico in 2010. And it was surprising for me to read that 50% of the teachers said that they didn't use technology in the class. That's 2010, eight years ago. 
And uh, I think what happens is that we sometimes want to do a lot in the class with technology. So I would advise those teachers to take little steps. Don't, don't go that far. Don't be so ambitious at first. Do little things in your classrooms. I don't know, you want to play a game, download a template that is already prepared uh, on PowerPoint, for example, or create uh, something also in PowerPoint using some links in, inside the presentation, or create a document yourself and then ask your students to participate somehow or to answer some questions. Something that is very simple, and then once you get familiarity, once you get confidence, you can uh, actually explore more. OK, great. Thank you for your answer. Mario Alpizar uh, um, is giving uh, his opinion here. He says, Jonathan, I think this question might help me as well in my current research. You've mentioned that it's not ethical for teachers in the 21st century um, to do not possess ICT skills. Not to possess, sorry, not to possess ICT skills. Uh, yes, I, I think it's not an excuse anymore. Um, teachers need to update themselves. And, and now technology is, um, th there is an article in, and also in my research, I start by saying that technology is not the panacea. Technology is not the cure to all our difficulties and to all our problems in, a, in the classroom. But technology is here and it's here to stay. Now it's our job to decide how to use it because every day we will have more and more students who are used to using technology and students who are used to, to watching videos and to see all these, uh, I, I don't know how many frames per minute they are used to see. And so they need variety and they need interaction and, and they need all of these things to happen in the classroom is if we want to keep their attention. So that's not an excuse anymore for teachers. Yeah, I agree with you. Mario Pizar is um, kind of repeating the question that I made before, but just uh, let me uh, repeat it. It says, what do you think could be a possible solution for teachers reluctant to change in and integrate in ICTs in class? And what skills are minimum for a teacher to handle? Well, um, about the skills we, we already uh, mentioned, take little steps, steps you feel comfortable with. And the skills that you need, that will depend on you. But I think the minimum skills is to be able to manage the basic tools of a computer, the basic apps that, or programs that a computer has, uh, being able to use PowerPoint, to use a Word, uh, to present a video, to download a video from YouTube, for example. That is, I think, a minimum skill that a teacher needs to have. And, and to uh, also to create a forum, for example, an online forum, once you find a website that you feel comfortable with, I think that's a skill we need to have. Those are probably minimum skills. Okay. Uh, Laxmi Reddy uh, said, uh, it's great, uh, it, yeah, it's great to participate in your presentation. Um, Esteban Mujica from Ventizo said, it's been an amazing webinar, Professor Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Susana Arenas said, I mean, she has a question. Should we find a common ground between the freedom we give students to implement technology in the classroom and the assessment criteria we choose to evaluate your language skills? Very interesting. Well, um, definitely there needs to be some boundaries. It's not that we're going to be absolute freedom. The teacher, um, the teacher is key in this process. I mean, if the teacher gives students technology and let them be, that wouldn't work at all. We want to use technology in the classroom. We want to, we want our students to feel comfortable using technology, but at the same time, we want them to know that we're going to evaluate them, that we're going to assess their performance. What I like about technology is that we not don't necessarily have to evaluate products, but we can evaluate processes of our students creating a, a, a presentation, either a spoken presentation or a written presentation. We can actually evaluate. We can use a lot of formative assessment instead of just summative assessment. When I think of, of tools like Quizlet or Kahoot or Socrative, for example, or quizzes, 
uh, I have used it with my students in elementary school. I am not allowed to use them as summative assessment because they are not uh, yet um, approved by the Ministry of Public Education in Costa Rica, but I use them as formative assessment and I make sure I take all the, the mistakes that I see from my students and I implement remedial classes later on so they perform better in the exams. Okay, thank you very much, Professor, Professor Elizondo. It, have, it has been great, an honor to have you here uh, in this webinar today. Um, I would like to remind the attendees the three questions that are going to be sent, okay, uh, through a Google form to all the persons who registered for these uh, uh, for this webinar. Okay, the questions are number one: What are the two major sections in which the model is divided? Number two: What is the difference between substitution and redefinition? And number three. What do the A and M stand for in the uh, SAMR model? Okay, remember, you don't need to send any, uh, any um, responses to our email. We're going to send you an email with a Google form that everybody's going to answer. If you want to receive the certificate of this webinar, uh, we're going to be very pleased to, to see your responses. And remember, you need to answer at least two in the, in the correct way of the three questions Professor Elizondo is sharing today with us. Um, well, uh, I need to, to share my screen now um, because I, I need to remind you certain things. And uh, let me mm -hmm. hear this one. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Um, well, um, we're finishing this, this webinar today and we, uh, we're glad we had Professor Elizondo today. And uh, we uh, also thank ACPI Costa Rica, Costa Rica TISO, uh, for um, helping us with this series of webinars of uh, Central America and the Caribbean basing TISO affiliates. Uh, we want to uh, remind you about upcoming events in the region. We have the 24th Beta Bolivia Convention in January. We also have a TISO Colombia 2019 um, convention in, in May. And we're going to have also ACPI TISO Costa Rica Convention 2019 in July in San Jose de Costa Rica. And um, well, uh, as a, a Ventisol member, I would like uh, to thank you uh, to be present during all the webinars we have had this year, 2018, uh, that benefit not only people for Central American and the Caribbean, but also to colleagues of other continents in the world. Uh, we have people from Europe, people from Asia, people from Africa, and of course, from the rest of America, uh, watching our webinars and we are very happy it is happening. Uh, we would like to thank you and we would like to wish you a Merry Christmas, Christmas and a Happy New Year with this final uh, slide that in which we say holidays are the best time to meet loved ones and spread a message of joy and cheerfulness. It is also a time to be grateful for the things this year has brought to your life. Happy holidays from the Ventiso family, family. And uh, well, we hope you to have you uh, next year. And um, Merry Christmas to everybody. Thank you very much, Professor Elizondo, Jesus Soto, Pedro Escalante, Esteban Mujica, for being with us today, helping us, the Ventiso media team. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>